So I would say in three words, um, simplicity, slim, and maybe elegant. Low top, Low top sleek, sleek, and original. original. Uh, finesse, finesse pointy, pointy and arrogant. Style, OP, stylish, à, casual, à ready to be one with whatever. Game, jogging, sweatpants, jean, shorts, jeans, shorts. And what I really like about it is you can wear it either skating or just chilling. You look good no matter what. No room for bad taste. Big Spin Podcast. We'll be spending this new episode of Switch Big Spin with uh, Stefan Janowski. We'll talk about the man, but also the notorious commercial success of his pro model shoe, one that never phased out throughout the years, seducing several generations of skateboarders. Mainly, we'll be pondering how did the Nike Janowski shoe become iconic. To better understand the phenomenon, we went and met skaters, designer, graphic artist, journalist, and one fashion specialist. We also chit-chatted with Stefan about shoes and skateboarding all together to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of his pro model. Let's start things off by looking at the background of Janowski, the skater. Born in 1979 in Vacaville, a small town close to Sacramento, California, he took up skating in the early 90s under the influence of videos such as the Plan B films or 411 video magazine. The mid-90s was when he eventually got noticed by Expedition 1, a board company Stéphane Laurence of episode 11 of Big Spin also represented. But one of the very first to have heard about Stéphane was Benjamin Debert, our guest in episode 5, over the phone when he was the editor-in-chief of French skate magazine Sugar. So I might have heard about Stefan Janowski from Thomas Campbell first. I think he was the one who brought him up during one of, un, one of our random phone conversations we would have back then. He knew Stefan from uh, friends of him surfers, and I think Stefan was crashing with them at the time, sleeping on the couch, or I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but they kept telling Thomas that He was an amazing skater and like he was the future of skateboarding and all Thomas would see was this kid just hanging out on their couch. So he had, I guess, trouble trying to see it really. And, uh, and then eventually he got a glimpse of Stefan in mags and videos and ended up realizing like, oh, that's the guy on the couch. That's So he, and, uh, yeah, somehow we ended up talking about him. And so that might be my first memory of hearing about Stefan. Stefan also caught the attention of Shoebrain Savior that he eventually went on his very first trip to Europe with. Friends especially remembers him for one specific trick he did on the one tour back in 2000, his switch flip at Le Dôme down the three flat four. The three flat four at Le Dôme, aka Le Palais de Tokyo, seven stair with quite the really lengthy gap in between the third and the fourth stair. By 2000, only a few people had made a handful of relatively basic tricks down it. Look up the article à propos de Mark posted online, listing them. Benjamin Debert was also there and remembers. So he ended up coming to Paris with Cairo Foster and Oliver Barton, who were shooting photos for Skateboard Magazine back then. And so they got in touch with me about staying one night or two at my place or something like this, and they eventually did. Stefan could tell, probably tell you how he ended up sleeping on my floor after uh, I told them like Tom Penny stories all, all evening. Uh, I remember him telling me later like, oh, it was the best night of my life. Hopefully, and I'm sure he actually had better nights than, uh, and more exciting ones than this one, but it's a fun memory for me too. So anyway, I ended up spending a few days in Paris. That's the week where Stefan went from being some guy that nobody has ever really heard of to the guy who switch flipped the uh, free flat four in at Le Dôme, in the famous spot in Paris, which is a huge double set. Cairo is trying to switch once I flip, but he had a really bad ankle, like all swollen and tweaked, and I just had to stop skating, basically. It was hurting too much. I vividly remember Stefan switch hollying it first try, like a crazy switch holly, all tweaked, like, you know, the perfect one you would want to do once in your life, and you just did it first go on this huge double set and then he ran back and he was all hyped on the spot and uh, oh it was perfect and easy to skate and everything and uh, somehow I remember they got a call so someone in the crew had a phone mobile phones were like pretty rare back then and uh, Stefan ended up speaking to whoever called I think someone from the states and I remember like him like 
being super hyped and uh, explaining how he was at this amazing spot. It was so good and the side is perfect and the run up is perfect and you just can't get hurt. And we're talking about the dome double set, which a lot of people have been smoked on. And uh, so I still remember that, like it was such a funny thing to hear from him and he was so excited about skating the spot. And uh, so he was, yeah, whoever he was speaking to, explaining how he was going to try to do tricks on it, then it was probably going to be really fun to skate it, which something everybody was really scared to even try anything on. And basically, five minutes later, he was landing a switch flip. It took, so I was shooting a sequence on film, like as you would do back then, and I don't think I shot a really good one of it. And uh, Oliver was also shooting one, obviously, because he was the guy shooting for skateboarder and uh, so his one was in skateboarder and the mine ended up uh, being used in sugar magazine because that's what i was doing back then we might have done a poster with it not sure but i think so yeah i'm sure it was a poster even the sequence was not that good because the trick was too crazy to not be a poster <laughs> stefan also remembers that singular day when universe got turned around the switch flip yeah yeah that was my first time to paris uh no the only person who filmed it was elias bingham mm -hmm. uh really bad he cut off my whole body basically Whoa. like no no top part you know uh and ollie barton it was the first time i met ollie barton the first time i've been to paris first time i met tim o'connor i think it was the first one of the first savier trips so it was like a really it was a good a big trip for me wow i was very excited i was switch flipping every double set in my path <laughs> 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 and what was the process of the trick i was just at la dome and it was like it was a lot of people there like um cairo foster he was trying to switch frontside flip it and um my friend judd hertzler was was in town mm -hmm. on another trip it was just all these people were like it was like a skate park at, in at the dome though you know and i don't know i just someone was like oh you should see this double set around the corner and yeah <laughs> i was just in the i yeah double sets any like i said yeah i was just in switch flipping any double sets that came around so yeah and that one had really smooth ground so i was like yeah here we go mm -hmm. um yeah that was <laughs> cool i went and looked at it today it's really big <laughs> <laughs> benjamin isn't the only one who can validate stefan's skills on a board paul rodriguez and eric austin also know I don't remember like my first conversation with him, but we used to go when I was on City Stars. Poor Rodriguez. We used to go up to Reno um, and Sacramento, and Stefan's from Sacramento, California, and so we would go up there. And a good friend of ours, uh, Jeff Landy, photographer, was also friends with uh, Brandon Bebo and Stefan Janowski. So we would come up from LA and go link up with them and skate with them and their crew around their hometown. So early 2000s, around 2000, 2001. Um, that's when we first started meeting him and hanging out with him. I remember one time he met me in downtown Sacramento, just just him and, and uh, I think myself and maybe one other skate friend. And he just met up with us. We didn't know each other very well, but he took us around and showed us the spots. And uh, ever since then, that's, that's my dog. I'm trying to remember. Eric Custom. But that was the first time I actually skated with him, which is, I f f find it kind of funny, you know, it's, you're across the world in, in, in Tokyo, in Japan. We, we just ended up at the same skate spot. And so, and it was really, it was just, it was fun, you know. I mean, I, I knew who he was then, you know, because I'd seen stuff from, like, videos at that point. Uh, you know, knew, I already knew he was, like, re really good. But um, when we were skating the spot, he was, he was ripping, and it was... But he was really mellow, really mellow guy, you know, and that was the first time hanging out. Just, I wish I knew the year. <laughs> it's like They also both share memories of a trick Stefan did, which apparently left many people shook among U.S. skaters. Um, well... Poor Rodriguez. Of course, he always had some of my favorite switch flips. He switch flipped the triple set in Sacramento, and it was the famous triple set, and I remember I went there. He wasn't there, and I, I didn't watch it, but this was a cool story. I remember when I was a little kid, we were very strict. Like, if somebody did a trick at the spot, you don't do it, right? Like, no, we call it ABD, right? And I go there, and I'm with the City Stars team and the Girl and Chocolate team, and Keenan was there, Keenan Milton. And he switch flipped it that day also. And I remember giving him shit, like, Stefan Janowski already did that. You can't do that. And he comes from a generation where they were just like, whatever, man. Like, if you want to do a trick, just do a trick. And I was so little and so strict, like, 
nah man <laughs> like Stefan already did that just letting you know ABD so that's one trick that stands out in my mind because of that story and rest in peace to Keenan man there was a triple set in in Sacramento Eric Custom and he, he switch flipped that and I and it's funny like he's so he, it's so casual and so good he does it so easy I've skated that triple set and it's like I feel like it's so hard and you're pushing fast and you're just trying to stretch this trick across it and when he switch flipped it it looked like it was it was nothing like oh that's it you know just like having that? a sip of water you know is that that simple 2003 is when things really start to get going for Stefan, thanks to his part in the Habitat video Mosaic, one year after joining the company. He then reaches skateboarding's foreground and gets on Etni's shoes via Artosari. In 2006, he instead joins Nike, and in 2008, he's told that he would be the second Nike rider to get a pro model in the company, after Paul Rodriguez. Stefan gets around to sketching designs. 2009, the SB Zoom Stefan Janowski is born, promptly renamed the Janowski. 2013, the sales blow up, and the shoe is granted cult status as it starts getting seen on most everybody's feet. Let's catch up with Stefan again for a quick recap of his interest with shoes and the process behind this particular model. Skating actually really made me aware of shoes, I guess, because it messes them up so much, and then also it um, it really the shoes you're wearing affects the skateboarding a lot yeah so it's funny that you should ask one of my first memories of shoes because yeah it, it's almost like my shoe life started with skateboarding because that's when i started caring about the shoes you know and i'd go to like the weird like this called like ross like these discount stores where like mm, yeah. and i'd get like weird filas and adidas <laughs> and like converse and nikes yeah and there'd be duct tape and shoe goo all over them and mm -hmm. Um, but it's funny that you ask about my first memories because, yeah, as like a before skating, it's really hard to think about shoes. You wore skate shoes outside of skating? Oh, yeah. When I was in high school, like I was proud of my shoe goo holes because <laughs> nobody else skated at school. So, yeah. you know, if I'm like, your shoes are like, what's wrong with them? I'm like, yeah, it's because I skate, you know. And then also when you, you could identify skaters when you're a kid, you, you look at their shoes. Ah, that guy skates. Yeah. You're like, oh, and yeah, he's goofy footed. Yeah. Like, it's a camaraderie. Like, when you're a kid and you're going around, like, maybe with your parents or different places, different towns, and you see another kid with messed up shoes, you instantly have that thing. You're like, yeah, I you, you skate, I yeah. skate. And yeah. you're like, aha, yeah. So you had some uh, big shape shoes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then when I started getting free shoes, it was like, and that was kind of the style. Everything was really big. But they were free. I didn't care. I would have skated in anything. You gave me a, a free, you know, yeah. like, I don't, who knows what I was wearing. I was probably wearing some crazy Sauvier's at La Dome. Yeah. But I would have honestly wore anything because I was just excited. And, I, and they were sending me on trips. And I was with Brian Anderson. And, you know, it, yeah. So it didn't matter that the shoes were, like, really ugly and yeah. hard to skate in. <laughs> <laughs> and in your opinion, why, uh, why your shoe is so popular? I think it's just because it looks really good on everyone and not just like, you know, it looks good on, um, on children and adults and grandparents and girls and boys and skaters and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it's not like it, the, the, the style, like when you minus all the colorways and everything, just the actual design, it, it's, it's not like a trend or a, it's a timeless design. You can kind of just insert it into any year and it wouldn't look out of place. Mm -hmm. So I, th I, I think that's one of the reasons why everyone seems to like it. And here's what he replied after we asked him what was on his mind upon coming up with his design. Like my thing was like minimal. So like, like how you said the shoes were really big. Mm -hmm. And like on Nike, uh, at, at Nike at the time, they had no low profile shoes. Yeah. So the blazer was the, was the, was the most, the slimmest shoe they had. And the harbor, I would skate the harbor. And so they, didn't, they just didn't have a shoe that I wanted to wear in line. So that was the main purpose of me designing this shoe is because I really liked this style of shoe and they didn't have it. And he knows how it all ended up coming together. Like just from drawings in my sketchbooks, basically. It yeah. was just me drawing and just taking, like just talking about how I really needed like a long flat toe and I wanted no stuffing in the tongue because stuffing in the tongue is pointless and useless, purposeless, except to make your pants look bad. <laughs> um, and I just wanted it to be really like, just like the take away all of the most you can mm. and just leave what do you need, yeah. you know? So that was kind of it. 
and I just drew a lot of pictures. Like I draw a lot of pictures like sketchbook style and then I give it to James and he would draw it computer style, you know. When Stefan refers to James, the designer, he's talking about James Arizumi. Now in his 40s, James grew up in Hawaii between surfing and skateboarding, all the while in flip-flops the whole time, or so he loves to claim. He left to Cali to study architecture, but couldn't stand working in a suit. So he moved on to New York City for a career change and became a designer for shoe company Clay, an easy transition according to him. Clay also made Lakai, making for an opportunity to literally go back to Cali, work with the same people and design skate shoes. One Manchester, one Mark Johnson and a handful of models later, Nike SB hired him to move to Portland, Oregon, where the headquarters of the swoosh are based even though the SB department only consisted in a literal bare couple of offices at the time. It was in such a contest that James designed the Zoom Tray, another very technical shoe impregnated with various technologies, and yet another commercial win after which he moved on to designing the second model of a relatively strict Paul Rodriguez, and the Stefan's shoe after getting his sketches. The dice cast, as a dwindling amount of people still say. It just kept, kept going and going, so like, it took a few years to really like, turn into the thing it is but um yeah it just i remember you just start seeing everyone wearing them you know and, and and hearing from my friends i see everyone with their shoe i see every i keep seeing your shoe i keep seeing your shoe and then i keep kept seeing my shoe and now every day i go outside if you know if you're walking around you'll see someone with the shoe and uh, yeah just it just it yeah it kept going and going and going until yeah now we're here 10 years you know as far as practicality goes, we asked Yann Garin of Big Spin Episode 1 to give us his impressions regarding how the shoe performs. I can't remember nor pinpoint the very first time I skated it ever, but the board feel and how you could skate them straight out of the box was always so great. They were shockingly grippy too and would allow kickflips just one minimal flick at the top. Those features just make that model stand out from all the other shoes I've skated. They aren't especially comfortable but perform incredibly well for skating. At first we used to think the fabric looked easy to destroy but it actually turned out to be super strong. Just sugar the spots where the holes usually form and you can keep it for a long while. Regarding the technical aspects as well as the design and aesthetics of the shoe, we asked the opinion of Alexander Wise, graphic artist and designer, and Niue Wu, illustrator and artist, given their expertise on the subject and their past collaborations with Nike. Well, I think it came out at a time where um, a lot of skate shoes were like, very big and bulky. It kind of went against that trend and like, Alexander set, like a new shape for skate shoes that was like more kind of um, slimmer and more um, close fitting to the foot, maybe. And like also like maybe better for um, in terms of board control, really get a, a better... Um, feel for the board because the shoe is that much closer to your foot actually. The shoe came out at a moment in time where skate shoe design was shifting back towards um, vulcanized construction like with people like Jeff Rowley skating you know big gaps and stuff like with these kind of really thin shoes that kind of grabbed everybody's attention and it was like a marked a kind of turning point back to a, a really more basic construction of skate shoes like simpler uppers you know very simple soles getting away from like the big puffy tongues and like super detailed DC like S oriented like uh, type designs back to like you know back to basics approach keep it simple keep it strong that was the kind of you know the trend was shifting in any way at that time back towards this type of uh, uh, vulcanized construction and design wise what will you say making a sketch shoe? well I think the, the concept of having the least amount of stitching possible obviously kind of goes towards the idea of making a, a, a shoe that can't fall apart because it doesn't have that many seams. <clears throat> and also the, all the stitching in different seams are like towards the back of the shoe. So the whole front is like really protected for like ollies and whatever. So uh, I think it's a, you can just see it's a, a, a skate shoe by the way the pieces are put together and the, the shape of the shoe and the, the, the way that it's been actually I've taken a kind of a classic vulcanized silhouette and actually pushed it more to like a, a, a shoe that was totally designed for skateboarding. I think it's the first time that Nike designed a skate shoe from scratch, as opposed to, you know, taking a, a Dunk or a, an existing model, like a Blazer and whatever, and like updating it for like the skateboard community. In this case, they started with like a blank page and you set out to draw a really effective skate shoe, which is like, you know, in terms of where the stitching is placed and the materials that are used and the the thickness of the sole 
really contributed to make a unique and uh, standout silhouette. You know, really uh, breaking away from what Nike had done in the past, like with basketball shoes or running shoes, you know, they, uh, taking those type of silhouettes and adapting it to skateboarding. This time they really started, like, you know, from scratch and you know, actually came out with a, uh, a unique looking shoe. For me, the Janowski is a popular model. For me, the Janowski is a popular model because it grew into a lifestyle shoe, basically. SB and Nike's relationship with the skateboarding has gone through so many different phases. The most notorious one being the dunk phase, obviously. Basketball shoe originally and retouched for skateboarding. But before that, they made some really bulky models. And then 6.0 was super action sports branded with huge tongs meant to protect your feet. Zoom technology for extra cushioning. But I think the Janowski was the first sleek, casual silhouette they came up with. As though Nike had infused the DNA of old school boat shoes into a skate shoe. The vulcanized sole also gives it Californian skate shoe look of sorts. Pascal Montfort is a fashion specialist and sociologist who helped us piece together last few remaining clues as far as why the Janowski became such a classic, universally acclaimed. Just people naming a shoe model by its name is actually rather rare now. This one actually even has a nickname. Some call it the Jano. When you say stuff like McDo for McDonald's, Jano for Janowski, that's a sign of something that's fallen under pop culture, at least a compartment of it. Back when the shoe came out in 2009, a lot of skaters were intrigued by the idea of wearing Nike. It was the hot brand at the time, so if you skated and wanted to be cool, you'd want Nike shoes. But Nike didn't make silhouettes most of those people wanted at the time. Some skaters just couldn't wear overly tech shoes. Those just wouldn't match with the rest of their clothing. And that's when the Janowski came up. With its vulcanized style, half tennis shoe, half loafer, like some odd hybrid. So simultaneously singular and easy to wear, going well with the trendy looks at the time and allowing people who wanted to wear Nike shoes to get more than, say, more obnoxious Air Max. They were an alternative to say, I feel like skating in Nike but don't necessarily claim the athletic side and I actually don't want or need super technical shoes. It was easy to wear and looked elegant, so quite obviously the fascination skaters had for it quickly started overflowing and flooding high schools. Girls liked them too and also worried. You wouldn't look too out of touch wearing it, despite not being a skateboarder, the same way one doesn't look out of place in Chuck Taylor All-Stars if they don't play basketball. Voilà, on ne demande pas d'avoir un passé de basketteur. 2009, c'est le moment, c'est un des moments en tout cas. By 2009, being a skater had become quite cool and hard in high schools, which had never been the case before. Not just decades ago, but also up to the early 90s. Même des décennies début 2000. When skaters were still antagonized by most every other popular crowd. 2009 was when the skater became the cool guy, pretty much, ensuring validation from the girls and really... Once a shoe model gets validation from the girls, then things really start to get going on. That's how it worked out for all cult shoe models, really. Right now, the Air Force One, for instance. Validation from the girls' crowd is when a shoe goes from successful to commercial hit to cult classic. Starting from as soon as they express that they like it, and for good once they start actively sporting the shoe. Funnily enough, the Janowski is now more famous than the person he was made for and named by. 
connu que son que la, la, la mec pour lequel on l'a fait. C'est le cas, c'est le cas de. de non, mais comment c'est aussi de John in case. Gamins qui sont qui, qui sont. So many kids are completely insane about the Jumpman, but I've never really seen him play basketball. A lot of people nowadays actually don't even realize Jordan is somebody's name. That's because he universally transcended his whole name in a way. We're celebrating 10 years of the Janowski medal today, but we'll probably be celebrating the 20 years 10 years from now still. The model itself will have its ups and downs in popularity throughout the years. But right now it's established for good. That's all folks for today. Hoping that you enjoy your time with us. For this episode, we receive a lot of support and help from many collaborators. Bertrand Trichet, Fabien and Romain at Nike. Thanks to Stéphane Borgne and Thomas Busitil for the session. Thanks to Stéphane Janowski, Paul Rodriguez and Eric Austin for their availability. Thanks to Pascal Montfort, Yann Garin, Tony Brossard, Benjamin Debert, Nicolas Malinowski, Alexander Wise and Yu Wu for taking the time to reply to our question and share the impression with us. Thanks to Mehdi Pinson for the jingle. Big, big thanks to Emrick Nocus for the translation. Yann Faure, Soy Pandey for the dubbing. And don't forget about the Switch Bigger Spin on Live Skateboard Media website. Thanks for your attention and see you soon. And uh, sorry for the bad accent. <laughs> <laughs>